also for her uh, postdoc. She got her first job here as an assistant professor um, in what was then the Department of Biology, but uh, as you sure you know, evolved into our current department. She so started here in, in 1986 and also at the same time became curator of the, um, the Nikki yeah, collection, collection, which she still uh, curates. She became a full professor here in 1995 and was the chair of the department when I um, arrived in 99. She was actually chair from 98 to 2004. Um, she's also a professor in the Institute of the Environment and currently the president of the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology. Um, and despite all this excellent service, both um, here and outside the university, she um, has uh, maintained a very steady uh, research program consistently funded by NSF and a steady stream of publications in, in top-ranked journals. Um, the, uh, sort of the focus of Blair's uh, research, at least as my, uh, my perspective, is to make inferences about the ecology and behavior of extinct um, uh, vertebrates, uh, mostly carnivores, um, uh, based on inferences you can make um, from the fossils themselves and from comparing them and their abundances, or relative abundances, to um, those of extant uh, carnivores. Um, so she's going to tell us what sort of inferences um, she has been able to make by studying crack teeth and uh, complicated things. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Well, it's been a long time since I've talked to all of you, and some of you I've never talked to before, but many of you I have. And that's probably not a good thing. I think it must be at least 10 years. And in that last uh, 10 years, a lot has happened in my lab in terms of uh, different sorts of research. I mean, I did some my most favorite work on uh, the evolution of body size in carnivores and its association with extinction rates. And we've done a lot of work on various aspects of the paleobiology and ecology of the Rancho La Brea tar seeps, including studies of their taphonomy. And now I have, of course, I have had for the last few years students working on finite element analysis of uh, skull strength and all a great variety of things. And um, I guess that is one of the hallmarks of my lab is that we do work at a variety of levels. And so today, rather than talk about all of these things that have happened over the last 10 years, which I couldn't possibly do, um, I'm just going to pick two things that are sort of current right now, that both of which are, which are quite different from one another, as you can tell by the title, but are um, uh, fodder for two uh, in review NSF grants at the moment. So that's cracked teeth and complicated noses, as, the, as is the title here. So we'll start with uh, complicated noses, actually, and then move to cracked teeth. So complicated noses, but this is a great slide because it's actually got cracked teeth and complicated noses in one slide. So inside, as you can notice, there's a broken canine tooth here that was broken in life relative to that one, right? But we're starting with complicated noses. So inside the nose of every, almost every mammal, most mammals, is a complicated scroll of bones, um, which are known as turbinals or turbinates. And they are a diagnostic characteristic of, of the class mammalia. We usually divide these complex bones into three basic uh, groups of bones that are identified by their source of origin on the skull. So we have maxilloturbinates down here. This is a sagittal section of a domestic dog skull. So that's front and that's back, right? So here's uh, the maxilloturbinates, which are coming off of the maxilla bone. The nasoturbinates, which are relatively simple, um, coming off the nasal bones. And then behind them, in the case of the dog, is these less complicated scrolls, which we refer to as ethmoturbinates. And I put that sort of in quotes because, as it turns out, the ethmoturbinates do not solely derive from the ethmoid bone. But as we can see now through some of the work that we're doing and others have done, um, they're actually coming from sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone, and sometimes even the nasal bone. So there's quite a, a variety. But at any rate, we call them the ethmoturbinates. Now, if you look at this in cross-section, so here's the same skull going the other way just to keep you on your toes, ethmoturbinates, nasoturbinates, and maxilloturbinates. And if you look at a nice CT scan cross-section taken approximately through about there, you can see how complicated these bones can be in their architecture, especially these maxilloturbinates, which are highly branching in this case of a kit fox or all dogs for that matter. Ethmoturbinates also somewhat branching here. And then the nasoturbinates are this relatively simple branches that come down off the nasal bones, as you can see, and interestingly define, define a sort of um, open pipe-like space. And I will, at the very end of this 
complicated noses section, I will talk to you about what the function of that is now that we know. Okay, so what are the functions of these bones? Well, uh, the ethmo turbinates are primarily covered, uh, this is the dogma anyway, covered with um, olfactory epithelium, sensory epithelium, are involved in olfaction. Okay? The nasal turbinates are unclear, usually not much sensory epithelium at all, but more just uh, um, covered as the respiratory, as maxilloturbinates are, with simple ciliated, what we call respiratory epithelium. So the maxilloturbinates themselves are covered with this simple ciliatory um, ciliated uh, respiratory epithelium. So the function, of course, of the ethmoturbinates is olfaction. The function of the nasoturbinates was, is somewhat unclear. And the function of the maxilloturbinates is complicated. So that is the condition-inspired air, and it's involved in water and heat conservation. And so the three proposed functions are, actually, that the maxilloturbinates are involved in warming and moistening-inspired air, and I'll show you how this works. They are therefore involved in the reduction of respiratory evaporative water loss, very importantly. And there's been a third um, suggested function that has to do with moderation of brain temperature relative to body temperature, which is called selective brain cooling. And we'll talk about how that works as well. But first, let's look at how the turbinates work. So here's a cross section, a sagittal section again. This is a raccoon skull in this case. And here you see the maxilloturbinates. And air is flowing in through the external coanae and then down through in here to the throat and down to the lung. So as it passes over this complicated sort of radiator surface that's covered in this warm, moist epithelium, water becomes fully saturated with moisture, and it picks up body heat. So that by the time the air reaches the lungs, it's fully saturated with water and is at body temperature. Then as the air is exhaled, and that has obvious advantages both in not chilling you from the inside out and also um, in terms of respiration, have the air saturated. As this now hot, warm, warm, moist air is exhaled over this complicated surface, this surface has been previously dried and cooled by the inhalation. So as it passes over this dry or cool area, water is condenses out back onto the maxilloturbinate surface and heat is transferred. And in experiments on domestic dogs, it looks like up to 75 or 80 percent of the moisture in the heat that's added in every breath is retained on exhalation. So it's a very important um, function in the maxilloturbinates is heat and water conservation. Now this evolved extremely early in mammal history. We know, here's the vertebrate fossil record, so here's the Paleozoic, Mesozoic boundary and the AT boundary up there. So here's some mammals appearing in the Triassic here. And we know the earliest mammals have these bony turbinates, respiratory turbinates and ethmoturbinates at this time. And um, Jaap Hellenius, who used to be a long time ago a postdoc here, um, did his PhD on looking for evidence of turbinates in the ancestors of mammals, mammal-like reptiles. And he um, claims to have found them, some evidence of them existing in this lovely creature, a mammal-like reptile, the Gorgonopsian, um, that existed about 260 million years ago. The appearance of these bones is very key. It's probably, if, if he's right, and um, he, I kind of believe he is, it's an indicator of the evolution of endothermy, the earliest ev evolution of endothermy. So this is a bony, the respiratory turbinates are a bony indicator of warm blooded. And the reason they are is because they evolved in association with endothermy, because endothermy required higher ventilation rates. You have to take more breaths per minute, per hour, whatever. And with every breath in and out, you're adding water, losing water, losing water, basically losing water without this mechanism. So this mechanism evolved in order to retain both heat and water in endotherms. And we only see um, complicated turbinals in, in mammals and in birds, although they're cartilaginous, but not in um, reptiles and birds. Dinosaurs, of course, an interesting question. People continue to pursue evidence of turbinates in dinosaurs, but as yet, it's still um, inconclusive. All right, so that's the heat and water conservation function. The third function I mentioned is this kind of interesting one, especially over the last, I can't believe it's been so long now, 20 years, things have changed quite a bit. Just, But um, <clears throat> this is the brain cooling function, and it's very well developed in artiodactyls, even toad ungulates. 
but it's also present in cats, and it also seems to be present, although maybe designed somewhat differently, in lots of groups of, lots of mammals. Um, but it probably evolved independently in all these groups. Um, this is an artiodactyl head in a sagittal section. This is supposed to be the brain. There's blue blob here. And um, here we have the mucosal surface of the maxilloturbinates is what that's indicating. So as I said, when air comes in and you inhale, this uh, water evaporates off the surface, cooling the surface, the mucosal surface, which is, has a whole bunch of blood vessels sitting there right behind it. So blood that is draining this now cooled surface returns to the body. It has two choices in this artiodactyl and apparently in many mammals. It can either go directly to the body down this way or it can go to the cavernous sinus, which is at the base of the brain, which is where incoming arterial vessels carrying warm arterial blood, whoops, pointing to the wrong one, are coming in and they get bathed in this cool, this sort of pool of cool cavernous blood. They're separated from it by their vessel walls. But it cools the bl incoming blood to the brain such that the brain can be maintained at two or so degrees, maybe a little more sometimes, less than core body temperature. The um, notion of why, initially, why animals had this, and this was demonstrated in laboratory experiments with dogs and goats, um, was that during exercise, body temperature would rise quite extremely or rapidly, and the brain tissue, nervous tissue itself, was hypothesized to be more sensitive to heat than other body tissues. Now, that's been questioned since then, but that was the notion. And so in order to protect the brain from these higher elevated body temperatures, this mechanism evolved. So when brain cooling is on, they open this valve and allow the blood to flow to the cavernous sinus. But when brain cooling is off, then this valve is closed down and blood just bypasses this whole system and returns to the body. OK, so that was the, the dogma. And then in um, the 90s, um, with the um, invention of all kinds of cool data loggers that you could put into animals and um, measure their actual temperature in the wild while they're free ranging. Some South African um, physiologists and German physiologists went out and did this on wildebeest and uh, some African antelope like springbok as well. And they made a rather surprising discovery. So what they did is they went, they anesthetized the animals, they put temperature sensors, you know, here and here and in various places so they could compare brain versus body temperature. And then they let them go for a month, and then they came back a month later and chased them down, and caught them, and retrieved the, the data that was stored. And what they found was the opposite of what they expected, actually. What they found was that when, oh yes, the animals also had activity monitors on them that were simultaneously recording activity. What they found is when the animals were running away, as recorded by the activity monitors, the brain cooling mechanism was completely off. They weren't using it. The time when they were using it, mostly, was in the late afternoon when, as African ungulates are prone to do in the hot sun. They will move to the shade in the late part of the day, lie down, chew their cud, and just sit there and relax. And at that point, they would turn on brain cooling, the brain cooling function. They would allow their core temperature would actually rise in the late afternoon. And then as the sun fell, they could just lose heat by simple convection. The way animals lose heat, right, is by either by simple convection, that kind of thing, or if evaporative water loss, you sweat or you pant. By turning on this mechanism, it turns out at the base of the brain, the hypothalamus is sitting there. That's one of the things that tells your body it's time to sweat or pant. It's an important sensor that communicates to the body it's time to sweat or pant, you're too hot. They fooled that sensor, so to speak, by putting the brain cooling thing on, which allows their body temperature to rise, but they don't start sweating or panting. So they conserve water, and this is very important for these arid adapted ungulates, and it may be important, I mean, it's in goats and all kinds of animals, it may just be generally important, all these sorts of water conservation mechanisms in mammals. So that was really um, kind of fascinating, and it's been done for, we don't know that much about in other mammals, but hopefully we will get more information about this. But what this says then is that the selective brain cooling is actually more, and again, of the same of the reduction of um, evaporative water loss mechanism, which is interesting. OK, so all that background is fun and interesting. And it was there, so you would see that you were probably thinking, or at least I would think, that given all this important function of um, maxilloturbinates especially, and olfactory turbinates, of course, in terms of smell, 
One might expect that if you could do a comparative survey across a wide array of interesting, lovely animals, such as our carnivores, the best in the world, um, then you would um, see differences that were correlated with different requirements of heat and water conservation and or activity patterns in these different creatures. And that's what um, got me going on um, this whole long saga of looking at turbinate structure. Now, in the past, of course, it was really difficult to quantify aspects of these bones because they're hidden, basically, within the skull. And the only way to do it was to slice the skulls up. And um, of course, curators, as Kathy can attest to here, don't, collections managers and curators don't generally like um, biologists to come in and trash their skulls. But based on this early work, and there's some very good early work, you can see one, that there's quite a variety. These are just maxilloturbinates shown in cross-section. And so this is a person. People are really weird. We hardly have any um, turbinates whatsoever in terms of maxilloturbinates. Um, this is a bison, right? This is a badger. That's a um, seal. These are marsupials. And these are birds. Um, so you can see there's a whole array of design. Much of this does seem to be phylogenetic. This is part of the question in understanding some of this. But um, you can also see the carnivores, the two that are shown here, have quite complicated turbinates. So what about function? So we decided to try to look at this using now high-resolution X-ray computed CT scans, computed tomography. So this is a high-resolution CT scan of a fox skull transverse section. So that's the maxilloturbinate network beginning there. These are some FMO, and those are those nasal ones again. And um, this, all these x-rays were taken at the University of Texas Austin high-res um, CT scanning facility, who have some very skilled people there. But we didn't even know when we started whether we would be able to resolve these bones sufficiently to um, quantify them. But after much struggle, yes, we were. It's the hard part is visualizing it in the computer. And so what we've done now, I have over high resolution CT scans of over 40 carnivore species, ranging from weasels to bears. Um, we use some software called Amira that allows us to reconstruct and analyze the entire turbinate surface in three dimensions. So that's a sort of cross section showing you that's a cat kind of thing we're looking at. So we get these stacks of scans. The poor people who have struggled so hard for me doing this. Um, have to, you literally are sort of dissecting or virtually dissecting out these structures out of the skull. So you're set telling, you know, through a mirror saying, um, we're interested in this surface that's highlighted here. We're not interested in that, anything else. And you have to do this for all the scans or at least every 10 scans and then the mirror will interpolate between. It's rather time consuming and um, laborious. At any rate, what you can get ultimately, so I don't know if you can really, this is blown up larger than the nose of this cat here, but you can actually have the computer build a 3D model of the turbinate surface. So this is actually ethmo turbinates, and this is sort of respiratory turbinates here, pulled out of this cat skull, and then you can rotate it in the computer and go ooh and ah. But ultimately, what you want to do is get some numbers out of it, right? That means something. So what we did is we used a mirror to allow us to estimate the size of the whole chamber, the whole turbinate surface area, and then compare respiratory turbinates, or we'll call maxillary turbinates, versus the other turbinate surface areas, the naso and the ethmo turbinates. We are using it, and I'm only going to give you a little bit of results today, to explore the density of turbinates relative to nasal chamber size, how densely they're packed in there. That has an interesting question in terms of flow dynamics and the transfer of heat and moisture. The scaling of turbinate surface area within body size, how does it scale as animals get larger, and the relative extent of olfactory versus respiratory, which is what I'll focus on today. But here is, just to show you, I mean, it's difficult to know when you're doing these things if you're getting anything that approximates reality at all in the estimates of surface area. But this kind of data is reassuring in that sense. This is total turbinate surface area, so it's everything, the maxillo, ethmo, and nasoturbinate versus the log of body mass for about, I think, most, maybe 40 of our species, maybe 35 of our species here, broken down by family. And what's nice is that they do fall on a line. They're not all over the map, suggesting that we are getting something close to reality. There is some interesting scatter um, that may be of significance. These blue dots are dogs, tend to be a little bit high. Um, but notice the slope is less than one. It's close to what we expected for geometric surface 
geometric similarity if surface area was going up as the square of the volume. Um, but that means that larger species have relatively, oh yes, there's another. Larger species have relatively less total turbinate surface area. And that's actually you can, that should be expected in some sense for these larger species. And what the scaling should be exactly is not clear, but they do have lower metabolic rates. They're ventilating less frequently than small species. They have lessened their heat and water conservation problems by being large. So you might expect them to scale, not you know, isometrically, less in the same way. So that's nice. Um, but what I want to talk about is what our preliminary results here. I'm looking at comparing um, respiratory versus olfactory surface areas in animals that are fully aquatic, such as pinnipeds, seals, and sea lions, um, versus terrestrial relatives, carnivores, on the terrestrial side. And the expectation is, is that aquatic species should have greater respiratory surface area for their size and less olfactory area, because a fully aquatic species cannot use their sense of smell for foraging in the same way that terrestrial animals can because obviously odorants in water are not easily detected or at all detected by our noses. So um, they have probably forfeited that or may have relative to these. And within terrestrial animals, some species seem to be more olfactory oriented than others and we might be able to pick up that as well. But so far, we've been able to separate the respiratory surface area from the olfactory surface area for 16 species of carnivores. And they're shown here on the right. They're common names. This is a tree showing their, somewhat their relationships. Um, this side of the carnivore tree is known as the arctoid side as opposed to the phyloid or iluroid side that has the cats and the hyenas. This is the side with dogs, which are not included in this at the moment. Bears, um, seals, sea lions, uh, raccoons, and the mustelids, which includes you know, weasels and otters and wolverines and all kinds of these things, as you can see here. Oops, I just undid my mic. Hold on. OK. Over here, I've coded them for being full, what we're calling fully aquatic, semi-aquatic, and terrestrial based on you know, ecological behavioral data. If you look now at respiratory turbinate surface area, just that alone versus skull length. Now, body mass is generally the preferred parameter to measure against. But in this case, because we're including pinnipeds, seals and sea lions, it, your graph goes all crazy because seals and sea lions have this immense amount of blubber, blubber and mass, and so they end up you know, as total outliers. So we're going use skull length um, in this comparison. Now I've tried to fill in these dots rather crudely, not very well, <laughs> blue, for the aquatic species. And you can see that the aquatic species in general, at least three of them, are doing as predicted. That is the um, sea otter, the elephant seal, and the leopard seal. The California sea lion is surprisingly low, and we've only done one, so we need to do another one and see if that's going to stay in that position. This is the tropical monk seal. So the fact that the tropical monk seal has less respiratory surface area is more like a terrestrial species. It's sort of like an exception that proves the rule, because this is an extinct seal that lived in the Caribbean entirely in very warm waters, and so perhaps did not need to have the intense um, heat conservation apparatus that these other creatures do. The rest of the terrestrial semi-aquatics are sort of falling in between, and uh, that's fine, we need more species. The olfactory shows a nice, cle much cleaner separation. So here are all the terrestrial species on this line and the fully aquatic here. So yes, indeed, it looks as though fully aquatic species have given up olfactory function <coughs> relative to their terrestrial um, counterparts. That, there's a nice thing going on with the semi-aquatics here. This is a mink, and this is the river otter, which do appear to have given up some. But notice the polar bear, which is uh, up there, is, is very similar to the other bears. And um, that actually makes sense, because polar bears are known to forage using a very good sense of smell. They can sense the presence of seals through something like three, maybe not three meters, maybe five feet, six feet of ice, and, and then go for it. So they're, they're still foraging with their noses, um, even though they're semi-aquatic. 
There's another way of looking at this, just looking at the relative percentage of the, of the turbinate mechanism that's devoted to respiratory, in this case blue versus other, which is mostly olfaction. And these are all the fully aquatic species, the pinnipeds. Here's the monk seal, which is the odd one out. Semi-aquatic, that's the river otter, also seeming to have uh, intense need for um, heat conservation. And then uh, the rest of these are uh, terrestrial mostly and semi-aquatic and show a much greater proportion towards olfaction. The wolverine is especially uh, remarkable here with a really enlarged uh, olfactory area. And wolverines, again, like the polar bears, are known for coming to bait when people are trying to trap them from over um, three miles away um, and, and in a beeline, <laughs> not because they saw it, but because they smell it. Just to give you an idea of the prettier pictures of what this really looks like, so here's a section, transverse sections through the head of a sea otter and a wolverine at approximately the same place, and you can see the sea otter is entirely devoted to uh, respiratory function, whereas the wolverine has some of its olfactory turbinates here. These are in sagittal sections, so you can see the tremendous uh, relative difference in these creatures, so there's a lot of uh, variability. So seeing this kind of variability is encouraging for all the future work and the much more work that we want to keep doing on um, these animals and all of the carnivores and making comparisons of animals in arid versus uh, mesic habitats, et cetera, et cetera. This slide is here, this is the last one in this section of the talk to show you for one. This is just uh, probably the most remarkable animal we've done so far. That's the cross section of a leopard seal's nose. That's all respiratory turbinate. You see the little nasal turbinate area right there. So it makes you wonder, I mean, this is the surface, this is the bone. Now all of that has to be covered with epithelium in the living animal. So how they actually breathe is quite remarkable. And what would happen to such an animal if it had a cold like I have right now is like it, it just couldn't be. I don't think they can have colds. I think that's just not, not an option. Okay, even with this, and that's the sea otter it looks, I thought, I was impressed by that when I first, when we first did this animal, now this blew it out of the water, so to speak, but. Now, this slide is here to remind me to talk about the nasoturbinates, because this has to do partly with the future work. So what is the function of these? They always are here, these little nasoturbinates define these nice little parallel pipes on either side, and on either side, and it wasn't really until <coughs> couple, last year, a year before, a paper was published by um, Brent Craven and his associates at Penn State, where they took an MR, a magnetic resonance image of an intact Labrador retriever head, dead head, but you know, full head, and they did an MRI on, of it, and they built in the computer a model of the head, and then they modeled flow through um, the nose, which is what I want to do next with Brent on more of these noses, especially wings that look like this. Well, one of the interesting things that they found is, and this is that raccoon head again, because it's nice and clear, is that in order to perfuse the olfactory area, really in ordinary breathing, the dog's air just went right down to the lungs, back and forth like this, and barely touched, if at all, any of the sensory epithelial area. So in order for them to really smell, they have to sniff. And when they sniff, when they increase the pressure, like in their flow models, air flows right through these little pipes, and ends up just perfusing the entire ethmoturbinal area. And so this is why we all sniff when we really want to smell something. Even humans do this, but dogs, cats, they all, when they, they're doing that, because without that, this, they're not really taking advantage of their full sensory area. So that was a nice insight from his flow study. There were many other interesting ones as well. Okay. I could say, any, I feel like I'm in a class. Any questions on this before I switch? <laughs> it won't be on the test. <laughs> but now I'm gonna switch gears completely. This is um, the cracked teeth portion, of course. And <coughs> you see some cracked teeth here. This is a tooth, this is a spotted hyena skull. So this tooth was broken in life, obviously worn subsequently, extra chips. This one was broken in life, it's worn. There are other, that one was broken in life as well. Um, so when I, this goes way back. This goes way back pre before I was UCLA. When I was doing my dissertation and I was measuring a lot of skulls at the Smithsonian for what I was doing then, uh, a lot of big carnivore skulls, I noticed frequently that I would see animals with teeth severely broken in life, sometimes the pulp cavity completely open and black, 
and you just go, oh, how did this you know, hyena live with this pain? When that was my first thought, but then was why I'm finding, you know, with regularity, I'm finding broken teeth with regularity. So I, after, or as a side project while I was finishing my dissertation, I said, well, I'm just gonna start recording the numbers of broken teeth for a big carnivore species. And so the fundamental methods here, quite simple. You uh, go out, you pick up a skull, you assign a skull to one of three tooth wear stages. Actually, there are five, but you end up condensing it to three when you do the analysis, but ranging from slight to heavy. So, and you need to do this because naturally the longer you live, the more you wear your teeth, the longer you live, the more likely you are, and we all know this, that we have broken a tooth. So we have to control in some way for age of the animals. And tooth wear is um, an easy method, not a perfect method for somewhat controlling for age. You record the number and the position of teeth broken in life. And then you do some statistics to look at fracture frequency differences. The first group that I did when I was way back when then, I just did nine large species that were well represented at the Smithsonian. Um, and what you see here are the results. And I categorized them or I, I, I coded them or I collected the data in as the percent of individuals with one or more broken tooth. So that's the, what you're seeing here. So you're ranging from somewhere about 40% to less, something like 10%. And I've color coded these according to their family. So these are the greens are hyenas, the blues are dogs, canids, and the orange are cats, felids. So you can see that the animals that break their teeth most often are the hyenas, which you might have predicted, because they're crunching on bones a lot. Although on the other hand, you might say, well, but evolution then should have made their teeth stronger so that everybody's crunching, you know, breaking at the same rate. Because, yeah, I forgot to mention one of the reasons this particularly interested me is bone, uh, teeth, unlike bones, don't heal. You only get the two sets, all these mammals, and they basically live with this adult set. If they break a tooth, that's it. It's over, right? So you would expect there to be what we call high safety factors built into teeth to prevent this from happening. But yet it was happening at a significant frequency. Now, mostly the bone crackers, but all of them showing some. So the summary of the results of that study were that about one in four individuals in all those species uh, on average had at least one broken tooth. Bone crackers, yes, broke their teeth more often. And then interestingly, over half of all broken teeth were canines. Now, the, this suggests that it has to do with what you eat, partly, that if you're gonna crunch on bones, bones are hard, they're as hard, almost as hard as your teeth, so that's probably what's gonna break your teeth. And then this, that they were more than half canines, was somewhat surprising because Canine teeth in, are so important behaviorally for these animals. They're important for killing, they're important in threat displays, intraspecific competition, and interspecific competition. So I was surprised by that, but the reason probably is, and it's a gruesome picture, is that when animals are making a kill, this is a male lion killing another male lion, um, they can encounter bone during the killing bite, and especially things like cats, but all of them can do that, and they probably try to avoid that, but when you're in this kind of a situation, you do what you have to do, and you do it quickly, and teeth might get broken. So that's one reason, and teeth, of course, these canine teeth are on the front line, they're involved in your fighting and killing, so they're more likely to get broken for that reason. And then the other reason, a more pleasant picture for you now, <laughs> is the shape of canine teeth. They tend to be long and pointy in some sense, because of what they're designed to do for killing and wounding things. Teeth are built of uh, mineral, right? They're built of enamel and dentin. Enamel and dentin are very good in compression. They can take compressive loads. They can't take bending loads. So when it's bent, they tend to snap. So when you're biting down and you hit bone and you're doing something that's rather dramatic, fighting or whatever, these long, tapered teeth are going to encounter unpredictable loads that are likely to break them. So I think that's why, presumably, of course, they break. So it's interesting because it suggests that canine teeth are, are uh, I don't want to use a bad pun, on the edge. <laughs> They're working a trade-off between being sharp enough to do their job as killing machines and uh, thick enough to resist the unpredictable loads that they get, and they're built out of a material that is, by nature, um, not very bendy at all, so it's a problem. Okay, 
So then, this is a long story, so, <laughs> oh, I'm going fast, I should slow down. <laughs> <No? coughs> I was worried I wasn't going to make it, but now I see, oh, God, I got plenty. Okay, we'll talk about the tar pits for 10 minutes. Yeah, oh, you have a question? Yes, good. K9. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's a confusing, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they're felid canine teeth. The canine teeth of felids. Sorry. The eye teeth, as they're sometimes called. All right. So I'd done that in the study on tooth fracture in carnivores um, before I came, or just about when I came to Los Angeles. And so here I am in Los Angeles then in the late 80s. And, and of course, I'm next door to the Rancho La Brea Tar Seeps. And as you know, as it's down the street, these are a very interesting fossil deposit, especially for people who study carnivores, because they have an upside down trophic dis distribution in the fossils that are there. And that's because the way they work is, or the way they have worked is, you know, tar seeps to the surface, or petroleum seeps to the surface, volatiles come off, it produces a sticky asphalt at the surface, and uh, this maybe gets covered in leaves or whatever, and some poor hapless herbivore walks over to drink and gets stuck, and then that attracts a whole array of carnivores. And for every herbivore that died in the tar seeps, there are about nine big carnivores that went down with it, and usually it's about, you know, mostly uh, dire wolves and, shown here, and saber-toothed cats. So um, it's great. So you have these enormous samples, 1,700 dire wolves, approximately 1,100 smilodon, 255 coyotes and 86 of these enormous um, extinct lions called the American lion, Panthera atrox. So this is um, great for a tooth fracture analysis requires big sample sizes. You can't do it with just five individuals. You need a minimum of 50. So, so here it was and I wanted to go, let's, let's go try it. And especially because this animal, this is the saber tooth, the skull of the saber tooth has this ridiculously long, as I just talked about, vulnerable canines. And yet those are clearly, and see that one's broken. <laughs> Um, they're clearly important in life to this animal, and yet would they have broken them? And would they have broken these teeth? Would they have ever contacted bone? Because it had been argued that these, actually in the literature, it's quite common for people to say that saber tooths were sort of high graders of carcasses. They would only take the flesh off and leave a lot of material behind and thereby benefit other carnivores. And one of one, the most important one, that is brought up in reference to this is humans, and that the humans would have benefited from the presence in Africa, from the presence of this kind of creature, which were there, because they could have scavenged from them and gotten huge payloads because they guys didn't eat any bone. So anyway, that was all very, let's go look at them and see if we can do fracture frequencies on these animals. Okay, well, of course, when you go to do a fossil record, then new problems crop up. You can't do a per skull fracture frequency anymore because you have fragmentary remains. You have partial skulls and partial jaws, and you don't know if you've got the left jaw and the right jaw of the same individual. So you have to switch. I had to switch to a per tooth fracture frequency. And the reason also is because the number of teeth present in the skull, the number of incisor teeth, canine teeth, premolars, molar teeth, um, in a complete skull is not necessarily what I find in the tar pits, and in fact it's not at all what you'd find in the tar pits, and that's what this is showing you. So a complete tooth row of a carnivore, this is of a dire wolf or a gray wolf, either one, has these proportions of incisors and canines and premolars and carnassials, which are the cutting teeth, and, and molars. This is the, what the sample at the tar pits looks like. So we have very few incisors and relatively few canines and a lot more of these other teeth. And the reason the incisors and the canines are underrepresented in the tar pits is because they're single rooted teeth, your incisors and your canines, yours are as well. And things fall apart in the tar pits. The, the soft tissue that holds the teeth in dissolves to some extent. The soft tissue that holds all the bones together, the elbows and the knees, has dissolved. So everything is disarticulated in the tar pits. So these single rooted teeth are the most likely ones to fall out and just not be there. So that's why they're underrepresented. Okay, so I switched to a per tooth fracture frequency and that's the way it'll be the rest of this talk. And this was my initial result. And it was um, dramatic. What you're seeing here are the orange bars. All of these are from Rancho La Brea, the top one, two, three, four, five, six. 
creatures. This is my nine species that I had before, plus the addition of the coyote. I added one in. So we can compare modern coyote sample and the Rancho La Brea coyote sample. Significantly more tooth fracture. These are the numbers of teeth. And those are the total sample sizes. Um, but what you can see is, with the exception of the puma and the bobcat, which are extremely rare at the tar pits, the four common species have tooth fracture frequencies that are nearly five times anything I observed in the recent. And when I saw this, I was um, very puzzled. And I didn't know quite what to make of it. Um, and we had to try to figure out, so is this something special about the tar pits? Is there something wrong with those animals? And one of the ideas, of course, that might be coming to mind is that because tar pits was this sort of predator attraction zone, when an animal would die, predators would come. Maybe it was attracted preferentially, and this comes up over and over again. Maybe the tar pits attracted preferentially old, sickly individuals. Um, that does not appear to be the case, and I'll show you some data. But for one thing, first thing you have to understand is that at the tar pits, when you look at the number of animals, herbivores, that died there, if you consider each of them kind of an event, um, and you divide it by the time span that's represented at the tar pits, one of those events where an herbivore died and nine carnivores went down only happened approximately every 75 to 100 years. So it wasn't like a place that you could say, put on your route if you were a big carnivore and say, I'm going by the tar pits today and see what's in there. <laughs> Probably, maybe you'd find a bird, but you wouldn't find one of those big animals, right? So, so that's unlikely for that reason. But then also, if you look at the age distribution of the animals that are buried in the tar pits, there's no apparent bias towards old or injured, injured individuals in the fossil predator samples. So what you're seeing here is my tooth wear classes now, slight, moderate, and heavy. This is for the Smilodon, is the dark blue, and then the American lion is bright blue, and then the African lion sample from Africa, extant African lion sample is in uh, whatever that color is. So, so you can see that they're very similar, and there's no, in fact, there's very few heavily worn individuals of Smilodon in the tar pits, a few more of Atrox, but there's no obvious bias towards moderate and heavily worn individuals for the cats. Here's a dire wolf versus a gray wolf sample. So gray wolves tend to have more heavily worn individuals. But again, no difference. And here's a Rancho La Brea coyote. And again, the predominant groups are the slight or the slight and moderate in all, in all cases. So it's not old individuals that ended up in the tar pits. So that's not why. It's not because I have both mostly old individuals and they have broken teeth. Another idea might be, well, but it's the Pleistocene. Those are big, big carnivores that you're looking at. And they were taking big, big prey, you know, mammoths, mastodons, big bison, things like that. So maybe there's a bias towards large carnivores breaking their, really large carnivores breaking their teeth more often. Well, um, no, there doesn't seem to be, at least based on living animals. This is about 36 species of carnivores ranging in size now from weasels to lions and hyenas. And that's the percent of broken teeth versus body mass. And there's there's no real relation. So no, what appears to explain it more, and what we argued at the time was that it was evidence that in the, at the tar pits, in the late Pleistocene, these carnivores were consuming carcasses more fully and more regularly than what we typically see today. That means they were eating more bone. That's what I mean by consuming carcasses more fully. They're finishing it, the whole thing off. Now, why would they do that? They would do that because food is limited for some reason. Now, it could be because there's so many carnivores fighting over things, so there's a real incentive to finish every carcass, every kill you get. It could be that prey were sparse. I don't, I don't know, but that's what we're going to continue here. Now, another thing you might be thinking, well, it's, again, as I got criticized after we published the paper, we got criticized. Maybe it's something about the La Brea area or something. You know, There wasn't fluoride in the water, so there were teeth all broke. Or yeah, <coughs> it's possible. But. Anyway, how to solve that is to have some other places. So actually, at the time, I'd already had the sample from, so here's what I have now. So then I, I've gone off now, and now I have four samples from disparate places in the New World of the late Pleistocene. I have high uh, numbers of carnivores where I can look at tooth fracture frequencies. So I now have the Alaskan permafrost. So that's, as you can see, 45 to 10,000 years ago. And I have two species done for that one, the gray wolf and the American lion. Not the A. Rancho La Brea, so those overlap directly. 
a San Josecito cave in Mexico, same approximate time frame. And then there's an interesting, another tar seep deposit down here in Peru um, that's dated at probably something that's too firm a date there, but it's somewhere around 14,000 years ago. So again, within the same late Pleistocene time window, and it has the same dire wolf smilodon pair that we have here, and lions as well. Now, three of these deposits can be considered what I call a predator trap, what I de defined for the tar pits by a place where predators are preferentially attracted and you tend to get higher proportions than you would if it was a uh, random sample of the landscape out there. So Rancho La Brea is definitely that type. This is an analogous tar seep. San Josecito Cave is a pitfall cave. It's one of those kind of caves that an animal would fall in and get stuck, and then other carnivores would be attracted. So it, again, is attracting carnivores, so those have that in common, although it's, it's a much more rare event than either of these. Um, but this is completely different. This is um, out on the open tundra. These are animals that died and were buried as in... Uh, uh, mud flows kinds of things, so it's not that kind of a situation. So just to remind you, when I did the, okay, the Rancho La Brea study just on Rancho La Brea, and actually, was about, anyway, what I had was this big gap between what I saw then and what we see now. So now I added in these, plus I did um, those 35 more species of living carnivores and broader samples, and this is what I have now. So now, this is the percent broken teeth um, for species ranked from lowest to highest here. Purple ones are all my, new, all my Pleistocene samples now, all the ones included that, that I just showed you in the past, the previous slide. And then all of these are the extant species, species means. So I have 36 extant carnivores, and they range up to about 6% with a mean of 2%. And the five Pleistocene start at 6% and go to 12.5 with a mean of 8%. So what's nice about this, well, two things. One, the Pleistocene pattern of increased fracture is upheld, in fact, reinforced. But now, instead of having this sort of bizarre gap, at least I'm, I'm blending in. So what appears that the Pleistocene is not anomalous, it's just at the far end of what we see today. And if we look in more closely, like just at the uh, species that are larger than 10 kilos, so we throw out the weasels and things like that, you can see a pretty nice gradation, although, again, Here's the coyote and the dire wolf, the saber-toothed cat, the gray wolf and the lion, still at the far end uh, to the right. Now, actually, some of these species, like the gray wolf and the coyote, but let's focus on the gray wolf, um, I actually looked across their entire range to look for population differences that might help me interpret the cause of tooth fracture. So if we break out some of these populations a little bit, and also the dire wolves can be split up a bit, and so here, you just see the four, this is the coyote, the smilodon, the permafrost gray wolf sample, and the American lion, both from the permafrost and La Brea mixed together. So those are those four. Now, you can see I've split out the dire wolves. The dire wolves, we can look at the ones from Peru, the ones from um, Mexico, and then the ones from the tar pits by two different tar pits. Notice how we range now from about 2% all the way up to 8%. So we're getting a kind of a mixing in that's kind of nice. This is the pit 13, which is an older pit. This is a younger pit um, at the tar pits. But there's Mexico and Peru being rather similar. And now here are my gray wolf samples, which are nice. And, the, and a coyote is in there somewhere, coyote, right. But notice where the gray wolves now are, it's all nicely interdigitated, like piano keys here. So we can now see that we have some gray wolves, Isle Royal gray wolf sample and uh, Minnesota and Michigan population from the 70s or 60s um, had relatively high rates of tooth fracture relative to these other gray wolves. Um, this turns out to be Isle Royal. There we have wolves that have gone through periods of deep food limitation. So we, that's, a, I'll talk, well, maybe I'll get to a tiny bit, that ecosystem at the end, but there's only moose on that island. The moose have cycled up and down, so the wolves have cycled up and down somewhat in tandem. And so these are animals that have gone through food deprivation. So that supports the idea that increased carcass utilization results in more tooth fracture. Same thing here. This was actually a study, a uh, population study by Dave Meat. And there was a deer, a crash in the deer population. And intraspecific aggression in these wolves went up as well as increased carcass utilization. Interestingly, these down here, only 1% tooth fracture. Yellowstone wolves introduced only what now, it's about 13, 14 years ago, but um, into a place that was chock full of elk. I mean, they were f 
and hog heaven for these wolves. And you see very little. These are the wolves that are from that early period um, when there was really hog heaven, very little tooth wear and fracture. So it's sort of reinforcing the notion that this causes of these high fracture is carcass utilization, which is what this picture was supposed to be to get you thinking about that. So why, so now I've gone from what I started out as just a sort of interesting little, I thought, you know, natural history study of why they might, how, how often animals break their teeth to having something that I think has very profound, potentially profound implications about what the Pleistocene was like and what we would think of as truly pristine ecosystems and how different they may have been than what we have now anywhere. So this is what I'm suggesting, is that higher levels of tooth wear and fracture, tooth wear and fracture in the Pleistocene carnivores suggest that food was more limited than is typical of modern and historical terrestrial predator-prey system. So this implies a relatively high ratio of predator to prey, and in such a situation, prey are harder to acquire. They're easier to lose once caught because there's a lot of carnivores out there. And then consuming carcasses more quickly and completely is favored, and that leads to more broken teeth. The take-home message, message is that modern systems are really depauperate in predators. There's nowhere on the planet today that we allow big predators to reach the carrying capacities that they potentially can, I would argue. And we don't allow it because they're dangerous. They're dangerous, they take our, they, we compete with them for food, they take our um, cattle, our sheep, they take our pets, they take our children, they'll take ourselves. We will not allow them to exist at the densities that they have, they can, for good reason. But. So, in, that's number one. So in pristine ecosystems, by that I mean prior to um, even uh, North American having Native Americans, prior to the arrival of humans in North America. These higher predator densities then likely acted to limit North American Pleistocene prey populations well below carrying capacity, which is something we also rarely see these days because we don't have very many predators. And if so, this means that top-down forcing would have played a more significant role than we see today, a very significant role in structuring terrestrial ecosystems. And we begin to see this now with what's happening in Yellowstone with the effects of the wolves trickling down all the way to uh, changes, of course, in the vegetation as the elk become less numerous, but also their behavioral changes of the elk in response to the presence of predators. That's altering the vegetation and that's influencing the birds as well as riparian systems. It's just an amazing ripple out effect from the wolves. And if we think about this North America before humans arrived as being a system in which predators limited the prey, large prey, then the addition of a human to that system in North America, especially this human, a flexible, omnivorous human, could then have triggered a sequential cascade of extinctions as it forced these other predators to switch from their preferred prey to less preferred prey and so on and so forth. And in this scenario, the Pleistocene megafaunal extinction would be primarily caused, and that is most of the deaths would be caused by the carnivores that were already here. The humans would simply be acting as a triggering mechanism to cause the sequential cascade. So we would start with them mammoths. Humans are well known for going for highly ranked prey, that is prey that is, gives you the most bang for the buck. Mammoths, mastodons, then the, they'd switch the lions and dire wolves would switch more to bison, to horses, to camels, and so on and so forth, causing the end of this uh, ecosystem, or a, a great alteration in the ecosystem, I should say. And this is somewhat reminiscent of something that may be happening now. And isn't it odd to think that we might have already done this in the past, and now with the onset of the hunting of great whales, humans moved out into the oceans and began to take great whales in large numbers. This forced the predator that was out there, the primary predator of these animals, the orcas, to switch to harbor seals, to switch to fur seals, to switch to sea lions, to switch to sea otters, which is now causing a decline of kelp ecosystems. So is this cascade somewhat a repeat of this cascade? And maybe we can prevent that from happening. Okay, final couple slides. So as far as the NSF grant about this goes, the test that we would like to try to do uh, is to demonstrate, we need to demonstrate that Pleistocene prey populations were limited. I might have convinced you that there were a lot of carnivores running around the landscape, but I can't have convinced you that prey populations were not food limited. And that's a fairly simple hypothesis that in a very simple sort of ecosystem way, as predator dental attrition, tooth wear and fracture goes up, 
then one would expect that prey, dental attrition, tooth wear, and not so much fracture would go down because they would not be food limited. So how can we test this? We need to look for evidence of prey dental attrition. Now, ungulates don't break their teeth, but what we're proposing to do is look for a variety of things that other people have looked for lots largely in sometimes the anthropological literature. You get these enamel defects, these bands are caused by some trauma that occurred to this individual when that tooth was forming in the jaw. They're called enamel dental hypoplasias. It can be caused by fever, it can be caused by starvation. They're not, you know, you can't specifically pin what it was, but it's a stress of some sort. And then you can take sections of teeth and at high, under a microscope, both in dentin and enamel, and even in the root. Um, but we're proposing to use dentin. You can see these lines running in this direction. Those are daily lines of incremental growth. So we can look at these and look for changes in fatness of the lines, the distance between them. We can look for condensations when you have periods of cessation, which is more likely what we'd see. So we can do this in ungulate teeth, um, and you can track It'll record probably the first four or five years of an ungulate's life, so we can look in that way. So this is what we propose to initially do, is to try to see if we can come up with these indicators of ungulate health that no one's really done in a big way before. And we're going to use, I already mentioned, two wonderful natural experiments. Here's Isle Royale study. Here's the up and down of the wolves, wolves in pink, and the moose in the gray squares for since 1959 to 2007. And these guys, Rolf Peterson and his predecessors and now his successors, have been collecting jaws from moose all through this. So we can sample times when there are, there are lots of wolves and few moose and opposite way around, which we plan to do. And here's the Yellowstone, wonderful new natural experiment, much younger. This is actually showing elk population 1920, but the experiment just started here and whatever that was, 1990-something. Um, with the addition of wolves at a time when the elk were are reputed to have been near carrying capacity and now the elk are here and the wolves are here. So we can compare at least maybe the initial elk and the current elk and see if we can pick something up in that way as well. So that's part of what is proposed in that NSF grant. And then once we have that, then we'll go run back to the permafrost samples and look at the bison and La Brea and the bison and the horses and all those animals from then. And, see if we see evidence of nutritional stress. So I will end there. I want to thank all my graduate students, most of which are listed, all of which are listed here over the past many years who have helped on the, the respiratory and maxillary olfactory turbinate project, as well as these are my two collaborators on the work I was just talking about at the end, Bill Ripple and Carolyn Rinaldi. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You can't really distinguish what caused the breakage, but I did try in the paper with the 36 species of carnivores to look for the effect of high levels of aggression within a species. But the problem was, and, I, and I, there was some indicator, but, but I, I you know, didn't make a big deal about it because it's so hard. Out of these 36 species, I could only really classify you know, maybe 10 with confidence as being low aggression or high aggression. So I have the lions and hyenas, of course, high aggression, and then I forget what I had the low, you know, everybody else sort of fell into the low aggression. So it wasn't a very effective test. I mean, you really need to have better behavioral data, but um, I mean, it, it, the potential noticed, is there. I sort of noticed on that scale that you had, um, you know, Wolverines, which are thought to be high aggression, had low teeth breakage, but they're also known to be really solitary and quiet. Whereas the bison and the other Right. Also, yeah. Know, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's hard. There's so many factors, so that's, you know, makes it difficult. Yes. In the Pleistocene, or oh, sorry, in the Pleistocene, there's some interesting data that um, isn't that well publicized uh, by Dan Fisher at Michigan, where he's looked at uh, mammoth and mastodon tusks, and he's done this kind of growth ring, like I showed you, but using the tusks, and he actually shows yes, an increase in the in the widths of the growth bands as we approach the end of the Pleistocene at the time when they're supposed to be going extinct. So that suggests at that time they, the mammoths and the mastodon were not food limited. And so we have that. Um, other than that, there's other evidence from 
modern populations where we do see the influence of predators actually causing food, lim um, actually causing limiting the prey in a number of Canadian ecosystems especially where they have wolves and black bear and sometimes humans added in, they usually have to remove one of those or the prey are driven very close to extinction. So uh, we do see that it's, it's, it can happen in modern ecosystems, um, but as far as the Pleistocene, no, nobody's really tried to look for this because there hasn't been the real methodology. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't say anything about possibly good. I mean, if an animal well, I mean, what I can say is what we've seen with the Yellowstone wolves and, um, is they can have a massive infection and they live with it for years. So they, you know, they're recapturing some of these wolves and they'll uh, notice that the tooth has been broken and sometimes there's an abscess and then the next time they get it it's better but there's still something weird going on so it's not causing it's not being transmitted to any other individuals and somehow these individuals are able to persist it, it's quite remarkable I think we're, we're real yes and and there must the pain must just you know they must have some way of it, deadening it yeah it must just stop hurting it yeah up there and there yeah Yeah, so that's the other argument, of course, with the Pleistocene is climate change. And <laughs> a number of things that suggest that wasn't the case. Well, for one thing, what we're seeing from isotopic studies is that the ungulates, like horses and bison, are quite flexible in their diets, much more flexible than we think. So bison today we think of as grazers, and we think of them as grazers on C4 grasses generally. But um, in the past, they would switch from, from C3 to C4 plants, these different kinds of plants, from browse to graze, with much, uh, with quite a bit. So it doesn't, it, it's not making sense in terms of the climate argument for the extinction of these ungulates on the basis of them not being able to find food is looking weaker based on the facts, what we know about the flexibility of ungulate diets as shown in the fossil record, not based on today. So, but climate has to be worse.